Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me here on this Tuesday, April 28th edition of Bang the Book Radio. My name is Adam Burke, your host for the next half hour or so as we recap the NFL draft and take a look ahead to Saturday at Oaklawn Park with the Arkansas Derby with Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. Uh, we'll, I'll talk about the Arkansas Derby over at bangthebook.com this week. Also take a look at some more NFL futures on stuff. Basically a lot of what we're going to talk about here on today's segment with Brian. And as you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB and the number 200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. One guest joins me today, and that is Brian Blessing, once again, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. Brian, how's it going today, man? All right, Adam. Uh, listen, I'm telling you, the draft was a wonderful weekend. Nice diversion and good fun for three days. It definitely was a nice diversion for sure. What uh, What have the sports book directors been saying to you about how everything went for them? Uh, they just basically said industry-wise, the thing was a ridiculous record handle. And then, of course, out here, most of the joints closed down in mid-March, and they had uh, draft stuff that was up, and they actually took significant money on it before it was shut down. Did they wind up doing all right? Or, you know, did, is, I mean, a lot of times betters usually get the best of the books here with the draft. Any reports on how they did out there specifically? Uh, it ended up being a push, right? It depends, I guess, where you were uh, doing this. Uh, the books were sitting on a home run if it went under four quarterbacks. So the Packers, Jordan Love thing, uh, the Love deal turned into a push. Uh, wasn't a bad result for the books, but th- that would have been a home run for them if that had stayed under four quarterbacks. Well, and, and speaking of Green Bay here, I mean, everybody talking a lot about them and, and the decisions that they made. And, you know, look, a lot of times the 2020 or the uh, the draft for that year We'll have some level of significance on what happens during the upcoming season, especially when you talk about first-round picks, second-round picks, guys that are going to play from day one. Green Bay makes the move to get Jordan Love to sit behind Aaron Rodgers for a while. They don't really help their 2020 prospects very much, and it seems like the betting market has kind of revolted against them a little bit as a result to the point where Minnesota's even favored to win that division in some places. That was an odd dynamic, and that could turn into quite the soap opera. That let's see what what uh, Rogers' reaction to all this is going to be. Everybody was pouting for him. I don't know that we've heard that much from him, and it seemed like the relationship he had with Lafleur was kind of an odd one to begin with. And you wonder how much of this was, you know, input from the coach to the GM. But weird that they didn't really do much. It seemed to address the immediate situation. You know, you, you could end up looking back in this and laughing at it, you know, in a bunch of years because th- the same reaction was there when the Packers took Rodgers when Favre was there. Every, everybody went, they went ballistic back then. Oh, boy, why would they do that? Yeah, I I, I mean, I don't know. To, to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you're in win-now mode, but... They were also in win-now mode when they had Brett Favre. So, you know, I guess we'll kind of wait and see how that whole dynamic plays out. But, you know, the first 10 picks or so really kind of went the way, they kind of went status quo, sort of the way that everybody expected if there weren't any trades. The Giants made a surprising move taking Andrew Thomas, but we expected the Giants to probably wind up taking an offensive lineman anyway. It was just a matter of which one they were going to take. Did it surprise you on Thursday night that we didn't get any trades up we didn't get you know Tua going in some weird spot Tua and Herbert went back to back kind of as anticipated that surprised you or did you sort of expect as I did throughout the week that maybe because of the unique nature of this draft it would just kind of be that status quo sort of very conservative in nature no it surprised me I I, clearly I've in full marks to the Dolphins because they had a good read on what was going on because the the first shock to me was the Dolphins to go up to three if you were so in love with Tua not run the risk uh someone would have done something at four and maybe you could even make a case the Andrew Thomas pick was a little you know they had so many choices did the Giants and they they went with uh, Andrew Thomas um but it was uh, to me you know 
the Lions not moving out of three, dropping down, getting extra picks, and still getting a CUDA, I thought uh, were, it was a little bit surprising. I thought the Henry Ruggs first wide receiver taken was, you know, that's the Raiders at their best. I mean, he's either Tyree Kill or he's Marquise Goodwin, and I don't think there's any middle ground. He's either a home run or just a guy that can run really fast. And then their pick of Arnett at 19 was way off the board. And, you know, at the end of the day, the GMs, hey, you get your guy, you don't care, you want to make sure you get the guy you want. I get it. Um, I think it's pretty hard-pressed to think they couldn't have got him, <laughs> you know, uh, certainly in the second round. So, And then the Raiders drafted so many wide receivers. Uh, that was of, of note, I thought. But, you know, you look at specifically the Raiders and Denver the NFL's a copycat league. They're clearly sitting there going, well, we're facing Mahomes and Hill and Watkins and whatever. I mean, we're facing them for the next five, six, seven years at their peak. We better be able to find ways to be able to score points and try to keep up with them and hang around. So clearly it seemed to me the Raiders and Broncos drafts were geared towards competing in the AFC West specifically. That's an excellent point, and I sort of wonder here, I mean, obviously, you know, we don't know what the schedule is going to look like. We don't know where games are going to be played, if fans will be there, things of that sort. But it does kind of look like an arms race here in the AFC West in the sense that maybe this is a stone-cold over division with, you know, what the Raiders are trying to do, what the Broncos are trying to do in copying the Chiefs. And then, of course, you've got the Chargers, who have a bevy of skill position players themselves. Now they've got Tyrod Taylor keeping the seat warm for Justin Herbert. AFC West race should be very interesting, to say the least. What about in terms of your your analysis of this draft, Brian? Anybody stand out to you as, you know, being, uh, at least on paper here, a pretty clear-cut winner? No, I, I mean, I thought, well, I, I think Lynch really knows what he's doing, you know, with the Niners. Um, and uh, the other thing, you know, we sat there, and maybe it's just the function of, you had five weeks to talk about it, and maybe you're trying to manufacture something out of it, and you're going, well, all these years, if there was an, ever a time where you know Belichick may jump up and, and do something, and you know, sure enough, you know, gets to the Patriots pick, he you know, gives his dog a biscuit, and he trades down. You know, it's unbelievable. He ain't, he's not changing his format. And honestly, you know, that's Belichick just saying, Tom who? You know, Belichick's going to do it his way and and prove that that his way's the right way. So I thought that was interesting because I did think the Patriots could conceivably, you know, make some noise finally and I didn't I didn't thought it was jump up and you know grab a quarterback, but you look at the guys he drafted typical typical Raider or uh, you know, Belichick pick for the Patriots. The Kyle Duggar kid, small school, uh, a lot of people thought this guy is just a good football player. They get a good lineman out of Michigan, and on and on it goes. I mean, and, I, you know, in time, I bet you the Patriots had a really good draft. Well, and of course, you know, I mean, some of these guys will have a tangible impact on the 2020 season. Some of these guys won't. Some of these guys will wind up sitting behind more established players, kind of learning, sort of being, you know, in that mentor and mentee type of role. But it is really important to sort of look at the overall picture of the draft here because, perception at this time of the year dictates so much out there in the NFL betting markets. And I mentioned at the top of the segment here that, you know, what the Packers opted to do trading up to get Jordan love alienating their star quarterback in the process. We've seen that ripple effect out there in the betting market where the Vikings, even though they lost Stefan Diggs, even though they lost some guys on defense, you know, they're kind of getting elevated a little bit in the minds of everybody there in that NFC North division. So the Packers are a clear loser at this point in time, both in the court of public opinion and quite possibly, you know, organizationally, if love isn't the guy, any other teams that you feel like, you know, sort of get the loser label here for what they did uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I don't understand. uh, And I, I think it's a, he's going to be a good player. Um, Just going that high up with the Eagles and hurts. I'm just maybe I'm just trying to read too much into it, but are they saying they don't think you know Wentz is the guy he was? I'm I, I thought that was a little bit curious. Uh, yeah, we'll, maybe we'll see what kind of packages they run for the guy, or it's a really good insurance policy if, if uh, Wentz were to get hurt. 
I, I just thought that that was a that was an odd one. No, that that's fair, and, and also too, I mean, that's another one there in that NFC East division where CD Lamb just falls all the way down to Jerry Jones on his you know twenty five million dollar yacht, and it's an easy no brainer kind of pick to take CD Lamb, and that was another one out there in the court of public opinion where. Now perceptions kind of shifted a little bit between Dallas and Philadelphia to the point where Dallas, you know, pretty much the predominant favorite across the market for the NFC East, lower Super Bowl odds, lower NFC odds at some of the places out there in the market. And it's due in large part to the fact that, you know, Dak Prescott had a weapon fall into his lap here. The Eagles, they opted not to move up. They get Jalen Rieger, who was kind of a fringy first round pick. CeeDee Lamb, it was, you know, over under 12 and a half. Jalen Rieger, it was, will he be a first-round pick, yes or no? Then you get Hurts, you get the questions about Wentz, you know, stuff like that. So, again, two spots in the court of public opinion in divisions that appear to be toss-ups, the NFC East and the NFC North, where what happened in the draft kind of dictating where the odds are going at least to this point. Well, you know, I'll throw this out there. Uh, uh you know, full disclosure, you know I talk about the Bills a lot. If you if you threw Stefan Diggs in as a first round pick, the Bills had a massive home run. I mean, it's phenomenal. What it's so refreshing for a Bills fan after so many years of ineptitude to have a guy in an organization that kinda know what they're doing now. Brandon Bean's terrific. He and McDermott really have their act together. So if you plug Diggs in there, as their first round pick, which was they said that's what it was, and we had this discussion last week. Was Brandon Bean telling you all these wide receivers? You know how good is this class? It's deep, but he's sitting there saying, "I I need the produ- I need the guaranteed production that I get with Diggs now, instead of throwing the dart. Which guy's the guy, or which guy's going to be a really good wideout?" And then they get the Epinesa kid who was on the short list. Uh, for them to take, but it's like there was no way he's going to get to them at 54. Some people had a first-round grade on him. They get him. Then you're considering maybe you make the Fournette deal, but they get the running back Moss out of Utah. And then the guy I know I was drooling over with you uh, in the draft because I was praying the Bills would take him was this Antonio Gandy-Golden, the big wide receiver from Liberty, and he was there for them in the third round. And they didn't take him. They took Davis, the wide receiver, big, tall, fast wide receiver. Uh, and I'm like, well, hey, I trust their you know judgment a lot better than mine. But need-wise, what they did was spectacular uh, because they addressed every need. And they, they were stacked to begin with. The defense got better. The offense got significantly better. And you look at the numbers that are out there now. They're 20-1 to 1 to win a Super Bowl and 12-1 to 1 to win the AFC. Uh, and that's only inflated because how good Baltimore and Kansas City are. Uh, and then, then Fromm drops into them, and you know, so they maybe get a backup uh, for them to you know model for years to come. I just, I thought honestly, it flies under the radar because they didn't have a first round pick. I thought Brandon Bean did a great job. No, I think so too, and and that's another thing that you know we were kind of talking about a little bit last week, and something I was kind of discussing with some people during the draft. You, know, you mentioned Lynch, and and you mentioned what San Francisco did. I mean, it's brilliant. You saved twenty million dollars replacing DeForest Buckner with Javon Kinlaw. You move back a pick for Tampa Bay to take Wirfs when you had no interest in him anyway. Because you were getting Williams. Right. The the, the Ravens. I mean, they just always draft great linebackers in the first round. Patrick Queen's probably going to become a superstar. When you've got a front office and a process and a group of people that you can trust, it resonates. And, And you've got that with the Bills. I think the Browns had a very good draft as well, so I'm very excited about that, very happy about that. And those things kind of you know, illustrate themselves out there with the confidence that you see in the betting market coming out of the draft. Hey, as we're recording this by chance, do you have your TV on? No, I don't. What's up? Uh, oh, well, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm paying attention to you. Uh, but they're, uh, they're showing the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds are flying over New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, to, uh, in honor of the first responders and, and all the doctors and nurses. I was just going to say, I don't know if anybody's watching this thing. Uh, they, the Thunderbirds did this here two weeks ago. It's it, it's unbelievable. You you can't even explain. You're watching it on TV, and the, you know, they're flying. and Well, they're covering states <laughs> right now while they're showing this. They literally went from the one side of this valley 
Uh, it was unbelievable. You know, they covered they covered 25 miles. I'm not kidding you. I mean, they shot across the valley. It was like it took 15 seconds. It, it's like it's an unbelievable thing to see. And you're oh, watching yeah, it. Sure. You're watching it on TV, and it's like, oh, oh, well, yeah, they're flying close together. And it, it, but they, they've been showing this for like five minutes now. Well, they just covered three states in ten minutes. Yeah, I, those those are impressive machines to be to be sure. I mean, you know, we used to have an air show here. Uh, I think Labor Day weekend it was down at Burke Lakefront Airport. Um, it's the only thing that the airport's really good for is having the air show. You get you know some private planes that kind of fly through. It's actually more of a waste of lakefront property than anything else but the air show was is always been a popular draw around here and you, you sort of wonder about things like that you know those outdoor exhibitions air shows and you know stuff like that here uh throughout the summer and the fall with this whole coronavirus thing but and b- by the way on that front i don't know slowly but surely some of these you know some of the states are opening up i, I it's just this things are be- becoming beyond frustrating to me uh the two sides of the aisle and you know the unwillingness to work together for just what's the greater good at the moment and all the agendas it's just nonsense um but we're looking ahead to uh the nhl uh and the nba possible return that they sent memos out to nba players i know the nhl that they'll hold out longer than anybody the nfl draft goes off great and then it comes out two days after the draft the schedule's coming out may 9th but they've got plans in place to move, if need be, to move the season back two weeks, take out the bye week, and take out the week between the championship game and the Super Bowl, or move it back even further, and the Super Bowl's the last week of February. So, you know, so much of this stuff is just so still up in the air. It's it's insane to me. It's, you know, it, it's just, it is what it is, man. We're all dealing with it, but in terms of, how this all comes to fruition. Let's see if we get golf back. If NASCAR comes back, now I know they've got plans in place, and uh, you know, hoping for the best. But it's starting to, it's starting. I've been pretty good. I've been pretty good. It's starting to wear on me. Yeah, it 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 varies for me from day to day. Some days it's just it's so much worse and so much more depressing, and other days it's kind of like, oh, good, things are going to come back eventually. And then you know, the next day you wake up, and you're like. Son of a bitch, it's still the same world that it was last night when I went to bed. And I don't know. I mean, what, NASCAR, I think May 17th is the first available date, I believe. Golf's supposed to be, what, June 9th, June 11th, something like that. So, I don't know. I guess we'll see. I mean, the the only thing about the NFL is these guys want to get paid. I just wonder how the Players Union signs off on Uh, no bye week. I'm really curious about that. I don't, know if, I don't know if they force you to expand from 53 men to, like, 60 or something to just try and give these guys some extra plays off. Well, there's a rule, practice reps there's off. A I, rule I now, and I was just reading this a little bit ago, uh, the Bills drafted a kicker. And, and basically, they didn't draft a kicker. He's a, I mean, he's going to compete for the job. He probably won't win it, but the, this guy is going to be a kickoff specialist. Uh, 50% of the time, House could, could, you know, get a touchback. You know, this kid will kick it out of the stadium every time. And uh, the rationale behind it was that they're making the rule is the practice squad's expanding. Oh, I'm going to hold my feet to the flame here. I don't have to have it open still. Uh, it, I, it was either it expanded from 10 to 12 or 12 to 14. Forgive me. But, but it meant that two practice players could be called in a week. So that's like the perfect thing that this kid's on. You put the kicking specialist on the practice squad and you keep calling them up to kick. So I think they're already, you know, starting to, you know, branch out on stuff like that. The other thing we talked about this with the NBA and the NHL. Uh, all these players, I don't, we haven't heard from the Players Association, have we, in, in either of these leagues? I just don't no, know. Not really. I don't know how you do this stuff. Um, you know, we sit here with all our pie in the sky ideas. Bottom line is the players have to sign off on this because there are going to be legalities. Oh, they they forced us to go do this and someone got sick. And before they even show up to do this stuff, don't you believe that the players collectively or the players association as a blanket is going to have to sign off? Yeah, the players are knowing knowing the circumstances are reporting and will play and then there's no repercussions. I, there's just so many tentacles to this thing. It's insane. 
Well, and especially, too, because you make future money with your playoff performance, with free agency and things like that, but you don't actually get paid for the playoffs. You know, you're out there, you win, you know, your your player share if you advance or whatever it actually is. You're playing for a championship. I mean, that obviously means a lot. Like I said, you're paying for future free agent dollars, but, you know, you don't get paid your salary for the playoffs. So, I don't know how that's going to work out either, especially, you know, if you come back and you don't do much of the regular season or none of the regular season, what do the other teams that don't make the playoffs end up saying? I, I, I don't know. But, I mean, again, you're getting to a point now where money really comes into play for the players, for the owners, for the networks, for the advertisers. Money is going to start to be the A number one factor here really soon, if it isn't already behind closed doors. So, Something has to give at some point, I think. Yeah, and I, I tell you, the other thing with an eye on the future, I don't know how you do it, but it wouldn't shock me if they did it. Like, you know, I Maybe the NHL does stage their draft in June, even if this thing isn't done. And you just say, here's the day we're going off, and then you've got some gray areas with some contingent picks uh, on on deadline day deals that were made. But just to, you know try to not have it impact the next season. You know, you want to be able to, you know, get these guys and have uh, th- have their development that the, you're not just eliminating, uh, you know, sight unseen rookies from having an opportunity to make the team this year. Uh, it, it wouldn't shock me if the NHL actually can, went on with their draft in June, maybe before they even, you know, uh, maybe before they even get back on the ice. Yeah, I I don't know. I guess we'll have to wait and see, but we talk about expanded rosters in other sports. How about the expanded roster this weekend at Oaklawn Park for the Arkansas Derby? Two divisions of three-year-olds, the best three-year-olds in horse racing here. Uh, I mean, look, you know what? It's supposed to be Kentucky Derby weekend. Obviously, it's not, but they shifted around some of the prep races, namely the Arkansas Derby here to run it on Saturday And we've got all kinds of big names in this thing uh, down at Oaklawn Park. And again, two races, race 11 and race 13, are going to be the grade one Arkansas Derbies. In between is the Oaklawn Handicap, which is a grade two race with a bigger purse. An excellent field for that one, too, including some previous Triple Crown contenders. That's four years and up. But the three-year-old races here, 11 and 13, look really, really strong overall. We'll talk about both divisions here for this race, but one thing I do want to mention here, uh, you like these big event race days because a lot of times you find significant value on the undercard before we even get to the main event. Well, normally, yes, on the undercard, but more than that, and this opportunity doesn't really exist that much this Saturday with only a handful of tracks going, but usually it's at, uh, you know, if the Arkansas Derby's going at Oakland, I'm sitting there drooling over the chances to make money at Santa Anita because all the best jockeys from Santa Anita have gone to Arkansas. So you know, th- that opportunity is gone, but the undercard will provide great races. The first leg of the Arkansas Derby, I I don't see – well, it's a horse race. And drawing the rail maybe is not the best, but the horse is a speed horse anyway, so it, that that's the preferred running style. The charlatan's even money for Bob Baffert. The horse is two for two. And if the horse, as long as the horse doesn't fall down coming out of the gate, if the horse breaks clean, it's over. I mean, the horse has raced, you know, two races, uh, won by five and three quarter, ten and a quarter lengths with 105 and 106 buyers. Two races at Santa Anita is working like an absolute monster. Literally, uh, you know, this is looks like American Pharaoh all over again, uh, where an unraced two year old is going to be an absolute beast. And you know, by the way. The mindset for this is a lot different. They're, these they split these up two half million dollar races instead of a million dollar race, uh, but you know usually the target was the first Saturday in May. I mean, literally this Charlotte in, uh if this was Derby Day, I mean I'm, clearly Baffert wouldn't have been running this horse in an optional eighty thousand race. He'd have run the horse in the Santa Anita Derby or something, got the points. Um, and he's in great form now. Question is who's going to be in great form at the end of the year or, or in the fall? When you move the Kentucky Derby there, taking a first glance at the second leg of this thing, uh, you mentioned uh, you know, the Tampa Bay horse 
Uh, was it Guillermo? King uh, Guillermo. King Guillermo. Yeah. Um, 49 to 1 in the Tampa Bay Derby. And then the morning line comes out here at 3 to 1. And, and I understand it was an awesome performance in the Tampa Bay Derby. But that's a horse that, and the owner, Victor Martinez, played for the, the Indians, the Red Sox, the Tigers. They were talking about moving that horse to turf. And Victor said, give it one more shot on dirt. And it goes out there and wins at effectively 50 to 1. And now it's like the second favorite in this race. I don't know about that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see. You got a post position for me? We're, we're doing this on the fly a little bit. Uh, uh, let's um, see. King Guillermo was King Guillermo's in the four post right next to Nadal, who is the favorite at five to two of the morning line favorite. Joel Rosario, Bob Baffert, they're the connections for that one. And then Wells Bayou, who won the Louisiana Derby all the way out there in, in post 11. For Brad Cox and you know for Brad Cox here I mean he's kind of been keeping to himself staying up in New York kind of quarantining this and that and he's got Wells Bayou here ready to go in this one with Florent Giroux I I feel like Wells Bayou's got a great shot on the outside here well you know the one thing I would tell you about the King Guillermo race I I mean it's not the way to play the game right when, when like you say yeah you want to bet the horse when uh, he's 49 to one and not three to one uh, but I will tell you, his numbers tower over these horses in this leg of this race. I mean, that la- that last race, he he runs that race here. Have a nice day. I mean, it's very deserving three to one. Very deserving. Is that one though where? And I know you've talked about this angle before. When a horse has that big, you know, kind of shoot your shot type of type of event, you generally don't like to come back on them, though, do you? Well, there's two two there's two tra- trains of thought there. I mean, if it was a you know a, a real hard battle the whole way, I mean, it could exact a toll. You know, in the Tampa Bay Derby, this horse this horse drew off for fun, one by four and three quarter lanes, could have won by more. I mean, he he won this race under wraps. No, sometimes the big win, you absolutely come right back on them. If it was a real elongated stretch battle and the horse won by a quarter of a length or something, sure, it can take something out of them. And you could say, oh, yeah, that's a bounce. You know, boy, the horse out of nowhere ran his career best. He's going to regress. And in many instances, that happens. But my favorite betting angle of all is I love horses. First race is a three-year-old because these horses can put on 150 pounds. They're more mentally mature and from a three-year-old to a two-year-old. And that's exactly what happened with King Guillermo. I mean, to the, not to the point where I don't even honestly. I didn't bet the race. I, I that day, uh, I'm crying now that I look at this because I, I, I'm sure there were others that ran the had the same kind of deal. But if you look at his horse, there's a couple, like you said, a couple races on the turf at Gulfstream. Uh, but the, the the race prior to that was November 30th. This was, you know, this, this is a son of Uncle Mo. I mean, the horse is bred in the purple here. But it was it was the first race of three year old. So to me, you know. He fires his 99 buyer figure, and I'm, I'm more inclined to say that this is who the horse is. I, I think they got something here. Honestly, he fired, uh, honestly, a uh, quick pass through this, Adam. He runs this race back, especially in this leg. Uh, it, that would not be the case if he was facing Charlatan. He, he, he caught lightning in a bottle, ended up in this, uh, in this event when they, when, they, when they split it up, and he avoided Charlatan. Now, I, honestly, if one pass at it, I would be playing Charlotte to win this thing. Last thing I want to ask you about here with the Arkansas Derby, I mean, with quarantine and everything that's going on here, lockdowns and stuff like that, I mean, these aren't if, – if we had the Kentucky Derby this weekend, the list of jockeys would look a little bit different. Some of the really big names aren't out there for this thing. A lot of them are, though. How much does that matter to you? You know, if you really like a horse, like, for example, King Guillermo, you know, Sammy Camacho is a veteran jockey, but not nearly as accomplished as a guy like a, you know, Joel Rosario, Javier Castellano, Florian Giroux, something like that. Even Joe Talamo is really, really good in races at Oaklawn Park. So how much does that matter to you? I mean, how much is it the driver and how much is it, you know, what's under the hood, so to speak? Oh, Jack, jockey's absolutely part of the equation. I mean, I've got certain guys. I just upgrade a horse automatically if the change is made to certain guys. In this vein, 
I'm I'm actually thrilled they're sticking with Camacho. I I enjoy this, and I understand why they would do something along these lines. Or oh my God, I got a chance to win the Kentucky Derby. I got to get one of the best jockeys in the business. And don't kid yourself, all the jockeys agents. I'm, I'm not saying Mike Smith, but guys like Mike Smith, John Velasquez, they're agents knocking on the door here. Can my guy ride your horse? And they're sticking with Camacho, and and I like that. I mean, you know, Stuart Elliott. You, know, you go back to. Um, Oh, um, I'm losing my marbles. Um, oh, the Philly Park horse. Oh, Smarty Jones. You know, St- Stuart Elliott, he's a journeyman. He stuck on Smarty Jones. They stuck with him. They reward him. They won the Derby. They won the Preakness. And people to this day think Elliott moved too soon. Could have won the Belmont. But but they stuck with him. Jeremy Rose, way back when, was an up-and-coming rider from Delaware Park. He made a mistake on a Fleet Alex in the Kentucky Derby. He ducked down to the rail, which was the dead part of the track. A Fleet Alex goes and destroys everybody in the Preakness and the Belmont. I think a Fleet Alex could have been uh, a Derby winner, a Triple Crown winner. But I, I, I appreciate when these guys stick it out with some loyalty. And honestly, because Camacho's on the horse, you'll probably get every bit of three to one or seven to two. And 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 the betting public will say, well, I'll I'll bet Rosario, or I'm going to bet. Um, Asmussen and Santana, they're, they're going to bet the big-name jockeys. Uh, Castellano's back. He's riding for Todd Pletcher. Those horses will take money. And you mentioned Giroux's a money rider for Brad Cox. And Wells Bayou looks really good. Um, you know, the the way I'm looking at it real quick, uh, what's interesting to me about, you know, the King Guillermo is the running style is, uh, he's got tactical speed. In this race, I can see him sitting just off Wells by you and pounces at the top of the stretch. No, I, I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's it's a cool little soap opera. But the thing that's so different is when we get to the Kentucky Derby, you know, some horse that's an also ran in this one of these two races runs fifth or something. You know, wouldn't have been the Kentucky Derby winner, but because the Kentucky Derby, what's our start date for the Derby? I don't have it in front of you. You know. Uh, is it first week in November? I think. November is it that, 2nd, no, first. Is it that late? I don't November seventh. Uh, I think it's November seventh or fourteenth, something like that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, at the at the end of the year, I didn't think it was that late because I thought there was still a chance for the Triple Crown. Uh, no, it's, it's yeah, it's September fifth. Yeah, it's not that. Oh, late. Sept- okay, my bad, my bad. Yeah, no, that the Belmont would have to be. Uh, you, you, you bleed that out into uh, October, I think, for the Belmont. For the so, the, so the Triple Crown's in play if all things go as planned. But the point is, somebody that runs fifth here and would have been nothing to consider for the Kentucky Derby, it's still a maturing three-year-old. And let's go several months down the line. And also ran in the Arkansas Derby could be the beast when we get to the Kentucky Derby. Always great to chat horse racing here with Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. Brian, how can people check out your two shows? New to two uh, Pacific time, KSHP.com, Adam, and, uh, you know, soldiering on and uh, hoping against hope that we get uh, some more good news. I put all the goodies out uh, on my Twitter account at Brian Blessing as well, and always love talking with you. It's fa- amazing how fast the uh, the week goes by now. And the, to the point where I, I almost did a double take. I'm, oh, yeah, it's Tuesday. You know, it's one of those weird things. So next Tuesday, I'll be here before you know it. Absolutely, man. Brian, always appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining me, sir. And we'll talk to you again next week. Bud, have a good day. There you go. There's Brian Blessing, once again, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. Sportsbookradio.com, KSHP.com. Also does the Hockey Betting Podcast. Uh, plenty of ways to check out Brian's work, uh, especially on Twitter, at Brian Blessing. Uh, No show on Wednesday. We'll be back on Thursday with the Betters Box, my MLB betting podcast. We'll chat some baseball in hopes that the season eventually does actually begin. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again on Thursday.